Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco, and I have the great fortune to direct the Environmental Change and Security Program here. It is my great fortune to be hosting today's session, Population and Climate Change, Relationships, Research, and Responses. We appreciate you all making the extra effort to come to a different room, in part because there are just so darn many of you. Um, we had about twice as many as we expected in RSVPing, so we appreciate your flexibility in grabbing lunch ahead of time and then coming into the auditorium where we could have a, a bigger space and uh, hear the insights of Joe and Brian um, on what I think we can all agree is an extremely important topic, extremely complex set of linkages, um, one that um, quite remarkably perhaps has been um, understudied and underanalyzed in the academic side and certainly um, what shall we say, uh, perhaps we haven't taken advantage of as many opportunities in the policy and the program side as we might. And so uh, as part of responding to that, uh, we here at the Wilson Center want to uh, offer up today's session uh, to have a taste of both of those worlds and, and kind of push, push the discussion forward. I see a few new faces, so just allow me to say a word about the Wilson Center. It is the formal memorial to Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president. Uh, he was our only president to have a PhD, so Congress in 1968 set up an institute that would bring the worlds of scholarship and the worlds of policy together so that they could learn from one another, which is very much uh, reflective in both our panels and certainly our audience here today. The Environmental Change and Security Program is now, I think we're in our 14th year. Uh, explicitly trying to bring both the scholars and the uh, practitioners together, but also a number of different audiences and crowds and, and actors in de development and health and population and environment, as well as broader foreign policy and even at times security policy actors. And so, uh, again, the audience today is reflective of some of these um, diverse sets of actors who, who come to these issues. Today's session, like a number of the ones that we do, um, is supported very generously by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health that has had the interest to focus on their issues but also understand how their issues connected to, to other um, big pressing global issues. And so today, obviously, we're looking at population and its connections to climate change. This is um, really in many ways the launch of a, of a series that we have that we've entitled Population, Health, and Environment, Building the Foundation for the Next 10 Years. We have a body of, of work both on the analytical and the programmatic side that we've tried to facilitate discussion about here at the center, um, and we want to then look forward to the next 10 years and, and try to understand um, where we've been and where, we're, where we need to go. I'm going to be very brief because you all should have had an opportunity to pick up the bios that give you the details and the background of our, of our two speakers, uh, two very distinguished gentlemen. Uh, Joe Spidell is going to kick us off. He's now adjunct professor uh, at uh, Berkeley, University of California. Or no, sorry, sorry, terrible. Uh, University of California, San Francisco. I'm sure that's a terrific offense. Um, uh, Not too bad. And, uh, in part, it's because Joe sat in a lot of different places. Um, as you can see uh, here in Washington at AID, long time at the Hewlett Foundation. Um, and so uh, we're very pleased that he can share his perspective from um, kind of gained and accumulated from all those uh, stops along the way. So it's terrific that, in fact, the second time in, in a month, we're very lucky to have him here at the Wilson Center. Uh, Brian O'Neill is a scientist at the Institute for a Study of Society and Environment, NCAR, out in Colorado, uh, which is a new spot, is coming from Europe, um, but where he's also Director of Population and Climate Change Program at EASA in Luxembourg. Uh, and it's terrific that Brian is here. We've had a number of people come to us here in Washington. Brian, tell us, well, you really just got to get Brian O'Neill to town. We really want to talk to him. So I'm sure your schedule is booked every minute that you're here in town. So it's terrific that uh, now that you're back in the States, it's been a little easier to, um, to have you join us here at the center. So it's a thrill. And, and, and Brian will go second. Then we'll have a q and I ask that when we do come to that, if you um, wait for one of my colleagues to bring your microphone, we're webcasting this uh, meeting live, and we want them to hear your questions as well. So, Joe, why don't I turn the floor over to you? Well, thanks for that uh, kind introduction, and it's really nice to see how much interest there is in this topic. It seems like uh, the population issue has a little bit fallen off the radar screen, and it 
looks like uh, global warming may be bringing it back uh, into a little bit of attention. Well, I'd like to start by saying that clearly this is a sophisticated audience, and they will recognize that uh, it's impossible to do justice to the topic of population policy and programs in about 20 minutes. So I will apologize in advance for what I'm sure are many omissions and oversimplifications. Um, I'd like to start out by just pointing out a few reasons why we should care about population, human rights, health, socioeconomic development, and the environment. And of course, we'll be talking more about that. And I'd also like to just show a few examples of human impact on the environment. Uh, it's beyond global warming, certainly. It includes forests, fisheries, cropland, water shortages, and finally, global warming. Now, this is the only slide that I'm going to show that shows the link between uh, CO2 emissions and population, uh, because Brian is going to give us a lot more detail on that topic. But if you look at these two graphs, it's very clear that per capita emissions have been fairly constant, both globally and in the United States. And the implication of that is uh, more people means more global emissions. Well, the impact of humans on the environment relates to at least these three issues, population size, per capita consumption, and the environmental impact of the technology that's used to produce what is consumed. And clearly, we have to address all three. Now, I'd like to turn to some numbers. Um, we've seen, I think, some dramatic change in growth rates, but the growth of numbers still remains high. And uh, if one looks at the average births per woman, they've certainly come down dramatically but uh, population growth is higher than it was in 1950. And in the US, population growth is also quite high. And, and throughout this talk, I'm going to use some US data because the US is the number one greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, that figure at the bottom, 95%, if we use the UN's definition of less developed countries, that figure would be 99% of growth is in developed countries. Now, this is the sort of classic uh, UN uh, projection of, with high, medium, and low variance. And the US Census Bureau, which is about the same as the medium variant. And those of you who know a lot about demography recognize that the UN is assuming really uh, substantial declines in fertility uh, to around replacement level by the time we hit 2050. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. I would really be happier if the UN said, we're going to get there if we do this, and that this is substantially increased support for reproductive health and family planning programs. Now this uh, table, I've laid out uh, what's going to happen in countries that contain 75% of the world's population in 2050. And you can see that Africa, of course, is the big gainer with a, roughly a billion more people in Africa. India, very substantial, uh, over half a billion. China is, uh, has only a small amount of growth, but because of age structure, even China is still growing, uh, more than 100 million people. And then uh, we come to a, a couple of other rapidly growing countries, Pakistan and the United States, and somehow we've lost track of the fact that the US is a rapidly growing nation. It's the only developed country that's growing rapidly. And you can see our 39% growth rate is just about on the level of the world at the bottom at 40%. Now I'd like to turn to uh, a little bit on causes of, of growth. And uh, I would point out that use of family planning uh, and lack of access at use of family planning is an important cause of population growth. And then if you look at both again at the world and the US, you can see that there are a very high proportion of unintended pregnancies, of total pregnancies, uh, very frequent abortion, 
and a very high number of unplanned births. And if you look at the unplanned births versus the population growth, you can see both in the world and in the United States, the unplanned births make up a very substantial share of population growth. <coughs> so what population policies have underlain our approach to population work? Uh, many of them have been based on the demographic transition theory, which assumes that the uh, need for economic value of children for child labor, and then the, uh, that death rates are very high among children, so that the idea would be that individuals have, make decisions to have large families, uh, and the result is la rapid population growth. Now this is a uh, chart showing the classic uh, demographic transition theory where birth rates and death rates are both high. Death rates decline, but the perception of those death rates lags behind, and then finally birth rates come down. So we've made the demographic transition to low birth rates and low death rates. Of course, there are some countries that seem hung up and haven't made the, uh, the decline in birth rates yet. Well, this demographic transition theory is based somewhat on the idea of the economic cost and benefit of childbearing. And the implication is that lowered fertility requires increasing the demand for small families. And here are some policies proposed to affect demand for children. They include socioeconomic development, education, especially focused on girls, improving women's status and economic opportunities, improvements in health, especially reproductive health and infant and child health. Now, of course, all of these are good things. But there's some problems with focusing population and policy on these demand levers. By demand, I mean demand for small families. For one thing, it sort of leaves out the biological mechanisms that regulate fertility, especially contraception and abortion. A second problem is that in many settings, the idea of small families has preceded uh, declines in infant mortality and other economic value of children. And just the idea of reducing fertility has resulted in lower fertility. And finally, high quality family planning services can overcome barriers such as low educational status of women. And this next slide shows an example of that. Uh, we've got two countries, both at about the, at the both both at about the same level of economic development. One which has a family planning program where they did everything right, that's Thailand. The Philippines with a much weaker program. And there you can see the rural and urban residency differences are not important. And even this very strong factor of education of women uh, is not very important in Thailand. Here's some more problems with the demand creation approach to population work. Uh, certainly these policies of intrinsic value, but the cost and difficulty of bringing about, say, economic development or education is quite great compared to meeting the existing d demand for family planning. And I think it's also fair to say that you might argue that providing the means to satisfy this demand should precede or at least go concomitant with increasing the demand. And here's a table at which many have, are, are a chart that many of you have seen before. It just shows that there is demand for family planning in many different countries with different levels of development. And I think the uh, history of the family planning movement shows that that demand exists. Between 1960 and 2005, we went from a contraceptive prevalence rate of just 9% to 58%, and during that same period, the total fertility rate, that is the completed family size per woman, declined by about half from around six to three. And what happened during that period, it wasn't, unfortunately, it wasn't that we got everybody educated, that all the developed uh, world became wealthy uh, or healthy, but in fact, the world community and many governments made a concerted effort to provide good family planning services. Now here's a couple of examples. In Thailand, uh, they started a program in the early 70s when the average family size was, was seven children. 
by 20 years later, that had declined to about two. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, fertility is quite low in Thailand. Another more recent example is Iran. They restored their national family planning program in 1989 with strong government support. One of the reasons they did this was they were looking at environmental degradation in Iran. And the total fertility rate declined from five and a half in 1988 to 2.8 in 1996, one of the most rapid declines in fertility on record. I've always liked uh, Dr. Potts' statement um, that all societies with unconstrained access to fertility regulation, including abortion, rapidly get down to replacement levels of fertility and often lower. And one thing you we should probably underline in this statement is abortion. Uh, abortion is um, often necessary to allow women and men to get to the fertility they want. Uh, this, by the way, this statement came out of Dr. Potts' article in the Population Development Review. If anybody wants to look it up, he backs up uh, that statement with good research. Now, I'd, I'd like to turn to what I think is the factor in population growth that is most amenable to program and policy intervention, and that's unintended pregnancy. Uh, you may recall from the previous chart, there were some 80 million pregnancies that are unintended, and there are about 200 million women in developing countries who would like to delay or stop bearing uh, ch children altogether. And about one-third of these women are relying on traditional, less effective means of fertility regulation, and about two-thirds have no access at all or face barriers they can't overcome uh, to using contraception. Now, I'd like to turn to uh, a missing element in the family planning picture, and that's funding. Uh, <clears throat> the ICPD, the International Conference on Population and Development, or the Cairo Conference, held in 1994, laid out these four categories of funding, family planning, reproductive health, HIV AIDS, and basic research. And I have uh, modified their original call for funds. Under the family planning rubric, I basically increased the amount from 11 to 15 billion, which is just an inflation factor. In reproductive health, they vastly underestimated the needs there. And I have to admit this is somewhat of an arbitrary figure, but at least 15 billion a year is needed. For HIV AIDS, uh, this is the UN AIDS estimate. Um, <clears throat> so it's a kind of a tidy 15 billion for each of those three factors, which gives us a bottom line of 45 billion instead of the Cairo's 18.5 billion. So now let's take a look at how we're doing. Um, how much, and I, I, I'm focusing on donors here. And the Cairo plan called for one-third of the funds to come from donors. That's been modified a bit to say that two-thirds of the funds for HIV AIDS should come from donors because of the poverty of the countries which are hard hit by HIV AIDS. So then the, on the far right, you can see the new targets for donors are about 5 billion, 5 billion, and 10 billion for each of those categories. Then if you look at the far left, you can see how we're doing. And this is 2003 data. Unfortunately, up-to-date data is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, not easy to get. But we're only at 10% of the target for family planning. We're, we were doing a little bit better for reproductive health and HIV AIDS at about a quarter of the target. Okay, how are we doing up-to-date? Now, these are projections. They're kind of fuzzy estimations. But uh, on the far right, you can see we've got a, t a total of 9.2 billion for all the Cairo categories of funding. Um, <clears throat> this top figure of general contributions is because we couldn't categorize, or the, the uh, UN FPA NIDI project couldn't categorize them into family planning, reproductive health, or basic research. But then when you take a look at where we are, um, remember our goal was 5 billion for family planning, 5 billion for reproductive health. So you can see we're way under that. Uh, we're in the millions on the far right. And then for HIV AIDS, the 10 billion goal, well, at 7.4 billion, we're getting a lot closer to where we need to be for HIV AIDS. But clearly the 
funding of the Cairo program is lopsided with a huge effort in HIV AIDS. Not that that isn't a good thing, but we're neglecting the other aspects of that uh, program. I'd also like to spend a minute or two talking about public support for family planning in the United States, where, where as you could recall, we were not doing very well in terms of unintended pregnancy. It's much higher in the United States than it is in Europe. About half of the 34 million women of reproductive age who need contraceptive services are low income and would benefit from publicly supported programs. Current uh, funding for these programs totals about $1.85 billion. This comes from a number of places, Title X. The biggest uh, part is Medicaid. But this is about half of the $3.5 billion needed. And a, a bit over a billion dollars comes from Medicaid. If you think this is a large share of Medicaid, uh, you would be wrong because the total Medicaid funding is $300 million a year. So family planning and other related reproductive health makes up a very small share of the total Medicaid budget in the U.S. Well, I've spoken a lot about the supply approach to family planning, making the services available. But that, too, has some limitations because we know in some places and some individuals uh, want large families. We know that there's cultural, religious, and familial opposition to use of contraception and abortion. We know that social, economic, and governmental institutions may be too weak or lack the courage to work in that area. Now, I've listed a number of reasons why uh, population work has lost salience. I think we have been focused on the decline in rates and not paid much attention to the annual increment of population growth. We've taken the UN projection seriously, and I would be happier if the UN would say, uh, we're going to get there if we do this and talk about what kind of services and supplies are needed. Uh, the developed countries are wrestling with low fertility and especially in Europe and Japan are very worried about fertility decline. And the International Conference on Population and Development, while a wonderful vision, it did criticize past population work and advanced a less focused paradigm of reproductive health. I think that especially the leadership for the United States has been weakened by vocal anti-abortion activists, conservative religious leaders, conservative think tanks, and for the last eight years, a conservative administration. And finally, we've, we have spoken a bit about how the AIDS crisis, to some extent, has co-opted the personnel, work, and attention, and funds uh, of many NGOs and health ministries. And this final little comment about donor fatigue, I think organizations that are supporting development work uh, get a bit weary at times of doing the same old thing. They want to move on to something new and exciting, even though the same old thing still deserves attention and still may have an effective program. And I, I spent eight years in the foundation world, and I can tell you this really applies to the foundation world. Well, I'd like to ask also spend a minute or two on why population is relatively neglected as an aspect of environmental preservation strategies. Many environmental organizations and environmental experts don't have the scientific expertise or knowledge in this area. They feel uncomfortable delving into it. There's the perception, and I guess the reality often, of controversy, especially relating to things like abortion and immigration. Uh, there's fear that engagement on population issues issues will alienate important audiences. And finally, there's some moral dilemmas surrounding north-south dynamics and stemming from America's high rate of consumption relative to the rest of the world. In other words, how are you going to lecture the rest of the world when we're doing so badly here? However, the cost of inaction will be high. If today's birth rates remain unchanged, world population would grow from 6.7 billion to 11.9 billion by 2050, threatening the social and economic progress and undermining efforts to preserve the natural environment. And here's my uh, conclusion that we need to greatly strengthen family planning programs that will slow population growth, especially by helping women avoid unintended pregnancies. And um, 
I think when I call for decreased consumption in the developed world, I always like to think of improved efficiency rather than people giving up things. And I think there's a lot that we could do uh, as, a, as a powerful uh, effort in the wealthy nations. Well, thanks for the attention to this, and uh, I'll be interested in questions later on. Thank you. Brian, why don't you just go right ahead? Okay. Uh, well, let me first switch slides. I could try to talk about your slides, but <laughs> maybe I shouldn't. They've heard that one. Okay, yes, that's me. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff and Gib for <coughs> inviting me to this event. I haven't been to the Wilson Center before, uh, but I've heard lots about it, and I have several colleagues who have passed through here at various times, um, and so I'm, I'm happy to finally uh, be here in person. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I just uh, arrived back to the U.S. Uh, after spending the last five and a half years in Austria, um, and now I'm in, in Colorado. So it's been a, a big change. Uh, Vienna's a, a lovely city. That's where I was living, urban apartment living. Um, the sun goes away in Vienna in about early November, and it does not appear again until March or April. Uh, now living in Colorado, it's basically sunny every day. Um, I'm also in a small town of you know less than 20,000 people, so it's been a major change. But I have to say, coming to D.C. Uh, today on a cold and gray day has really made me feel quite at home, uh, <laughs> actually. So I, I thank you for that. Um, I would also like to, before uh, jumping in, just uh, acknowledge that a lot of the, the work that I'm going to show is the product of a collaboration that involved lots of people. The three key ones I've listed up here, Mike Dalton, who's an economist with NOAA, uh, Lei Wen Jiang, who's a demographer at Brown University, and Shanali Pachari, who's also a, an energy economist uh, at IASA in, in Austria. Um, I thought I would start take a starting point of about seven years ago. Um, at that time, I and two co-authors from IASA published a book on population and climate change that was mostly an assessment of the literature, of what, what had been uh, written and what kind of research had been done up to that point in time. There was some analysis, but it was basically sort of relatively simple and back of the envelope. So at that time, the three key messages that, were, uh, that, that one could get from, from looking at work in this area were, number one, that probably um, on balance, if, you, if population growth were slowed, that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions significantly. Um, although that, those reductions in emissions would not really be, uh, um, you wouldn't really feel them until middle of the century and even more so second half of the century. It's not a, not a quick thing. Uh, and also, there were st several stones left unturned. Uh, not much work on the implications of aging or urbanization or other demographic things that might be happening along with a change in growth rates. Uh, second, that lower fertility and slower population growth would also, uh, on balance, probably make adapting to the impacts of climate change easier, both at the household level, uh, but also at the society-wide level. Um, a caveat there, though, as well, is that if you looked at any individual sector, health, agriculture, and so on, uh, no single, in no single sector would you conclude that population policies would be the primary way to go about uh, improving resilience. Um, but taken together, that set of conclusions, along with uh, the fact that investments in fertility-related policies, reproductive health, family planning programs, are beneficial on their own, in their own right, for reasons that have nothing to do with the environment, that one could consider them win-win kind of policies with respect to climate change. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the thing you should do first or the most important uh, climate policy or that it's going to solve the climate problem. Um, but nonetheless, uh, climate change is a big problem, and this was, appeared to be an opportunity. So what I'd like to do is give you an update on work since that time. Um, 
including some that we've been, when, been doing our, ourselves. But I'm going to focus on the population and emissions, so this bullet number one, where I, I spend uh, most of my time working. Uh, and I want to look at two things. First, some work on analyzing historical data, past experience, and then looking at some projections for the future. So let's start with historical uh, analyses. For quite some time, and, and, and before we published the book, uh, there were lots of, uh, or quite a number of analyses of, of historical emissions to look at, well, how much has population mattered to emissions growth in the past? And those were useful, um, but somewhat limited in that they assumed that the effect of population on emissions was proportional, that if population were 20% higher or lower, emissions would be 20% higher or lower. Given that relationship, how much has population mattered to growth in emissions in the past? What's happened that's been really, I think, useful and kind of obvious, but for whatever reason took a while to do, is to not assume that population was proportional, its effect on emissions was proportional, but to test it, uh, to set up a, a statistical um, analysis to, to test has the effect been proportional or greater or, or, or less. And the, the bottom line there is that generally this work has supported a roughly proportional effect of population, changes in population size uh, on emissions. It has also, in, in some analyses that considered it, supported uh, the, um, uh, the hypothesis that urbanization is also going to matter to emissions and also that age structure, changes in age structure may as well. Let me give you um, a, a little bit more detailed sense of, of what those results look like. This is a table of... Uh, six or seven or eight studies um, that have done this kind of analysis, testing the, the effect of population. And what it is is a table of elasticities. An elasticity means if you change population size by 1%, what percentage change will you get uh, in uh, emissions? That's what this column shows right here. And so you see the, the results here uh, range from uh, about half a percent there at the top. Uh, that was a study that only included countries from the EU. Um, the rest of them are all around one, either just below or just above one, which means a proportional effect. If population size is 1% higher, then all else equal, controlling for different levels of income, different economic structures, different levels of technology in the country, uh, that those things, controlling for those things, population uh, had a roughly proportional effect. Uh, these were studies, various kinds of, of data, um, some cross-sectional in just one year, some looking over 20 or 30 years of data uh, at the national, national level. Um, you see from the rest of the table there that there are uh, indications that urbanization and household size and, and uh, the age structure also matter um, in different ways, but today I wanted to, to focus on, on population size. So that's not the end of the story. That doesn't mean that this is guaranteed to hold forever. There are things that may be left out, indirect effects, for example, of population on economic growth, and then that affecting emissions. That, that is not, does not show up in, in these types of analyses. But it is at least suggestive that when you look at historical data, the, uh, the assumption that there's a roughly proportional relationship is not wildly off the mark. I want to spend uh, most of the time actually talking about then looking at future scenarios uh, of emissions and what they tell us about the potential effects of different population paths uh, on emissions. I think a good place to start is a set of scenarios that many of you are, are probably familiar with, but uh, at least to some extent. Um, and these are scenarios that were produced by the IPCC, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are sometimes some referred to in the jargon as the stress scenarios, um, which stands for Special Report on Emission Scenarios, which was produced, published by the IPCC in the year 2000. And these have served as kind of benchmark set of scenarios on which a lot of climate change analysis has been based and continues to be based uh, since then. The graph I'm showing you here is just to give you a flavor of what these look like. This is um, a set of, uh, the, or a subset of the stress scenarios that I'm showing the results for them for 
CO2 emissions uh, from the year 2000, and these are 100-year scenarios into the future. The way that these were produced uh, is sketched here on, on the right-hand side. So roughly speaking, the, 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 the methodology for doing this was first to develop, this is stage one here, four different just qualitative storylines about how development may occur globally in the future. Is it a fast, you know, a lot of globalization, fast economic growth? Is it a regionalizing world and maybe economic growth is slowing down and so on? So dividing up the future into four sort of um, alternative pathways. Then within each of those pathways, defining uh, quantitative driving forces, population growth, economic growth rates, technological progress, that were judged to be consistent with those storylines. And then using a bunch of different models uh, to model what the emissions outcomes would be based on those storylines and driving force assumptions. And here you see a, a subset of the 40 scenarios that you ended up with just for, for CO2. Now what we want to do is at least start off and say, well, for this standard set, can we get anything out of these for what's the influence of, of, uh, of population? The first thing to look at is what population assumptions did they actually use? Um, this graph here shows uh, the yellow shaded area is the range of assumptions for global population growth that were used in these IPCC scenarios. So these are projections, again, from the year 2000 to 2100. Uh, and you see at the low end, the lowest stress scenario uh, ends up with around 7 uh, billion people in the, by the end of the century, and the high one's around 15. The other lines on here are the set of global projections of population that have been made since that time. So what we want to look at is, you know, are, the, are those assumptions in the IPC scenarios still up to date? And uh, for a big part of the range, they are. So that, you know, a big part of this yellow range um, is also occupied by scenarios that have been produced more recently that... Um, support the idea that those are plausible outcomes. There are two exceptions. One is that the high end is a bit high. Uh, it looks relatively unlikely compared to current outlooks. And also, I think more importantly, is that the low end is not well represented. These two lines down here, one is the UN, the, the most recent long-term UN projection, UN low scenario, and the other one is the low end of the global projections done at EASA. So one thing that's important, I think, and, and known in the climate community, is that the low end of the current demographic range is not well represented in the IPCC scenarios. Now, there's been a lot of additional scenarios done by the climate change community since uh, these scenarios were produced, which were produced, recall, in, in the year 2000. Maybe they've done better. This shows about the, uh, roughly the same thing. These are the population assumptions. In the blue is, is basically the range we looked at before. It's extended a bit at the high end, but this blue shaded area is, again, basically the stress range. And all the individual lines are population assumptions used in emissions scenarios produced after the IPCC scenarios, so the more recent scenarios. And we see, again, the more recent papers being written on emission scenarios largely are fall within the stress range, and there's only one or two that are any, anywhere you know, at the low end of, of the current range of, of demographic projections. So I think you know, we can say it's largely still true. It was true in 2000. It's largely still true that that end of the range is not well represented, has not really been explored in emission scenarios. That being said, let's just take the set of stress scenarios themselves and say what's the relationship in these scenarios between... Uh, population that's assumed as a, driving, as, as a driving force and the resulting emissions. And there's, there's two stories here. What I've plotted is on, on the horizontal axis here is the global population size in the IPCC scenarios in the year 2100. Uh, and you see these group into basically into three groups because there were three, a low, a medium, and a high scenario used. And on the vertical axis here is the cumulative emissions of carbon over the whole 100 years, which is a reasonable measure of kind of the total effect on the atmosphere uh, of, from, from these emission scenarios. So you can see basically two kinds of relationships. 
The first is that if we take most of the scenarios, and by the way, these labels here uh, represent those four storylines I mentioned before. They were given the rather creative names of A1, A2, B1, and, and B2, um, but neutral. That was the idea. They're neutral names, not creative, but neutral. That's important, too. Um, and if, if we consider three out of the four storylines, there is, <coughs> roughly speaking, a relationship that if you have higher emissions in the stress scenarios, you end up with higher... Uh, if you have higher population, you, you also have higher emissions as a result. Um, at the same time, one can just look at uh, these two storylines and the set of scenarios that were, were produced according to those two storylines. And in there, you see an actu actually a larger range of emissions outcomes, all with the same population size. In fact, all with the low population scenario. The highest emission scenarios in the IPCC set are these. And they actually have the lowest population assumptions. Now, the reason that this happens is that this, this A1 storyline was used. It's a high economic, low population, high economic growth scenario that was used to do a kind of sensitivity analysis to make lots of different technology assumptions. So up here, there's an assumption that carbon intensive energy sources remain dominant and that there's a lot of technological progress, but it goes into producing better coal plants and so on. Whereas down here, there's a lot of technological development, but it's directed in, into renewables. And so I think that the, the message here, which I, is, is one that I will repeat uh, later on, is that in general, one can associate po uh, lower population with, with lower emissions, but it's not going to guarantee a low emissions outcome uh, on its own. And it, it doesn't in the stress scenarios. Okay, last, I would just like to show you some results of the modeling work that we've been doing, where our goal is to produce some of the global, these kind of global emission scenarios that we've just looked at, but explicitly look at what's the effect when you more or less keep all else equal, but have lower population rather than higher population. Now, I want to sort of um, lower your expectations here. I, I think I sound like the Clinton campaign at the moment. Um, but I want to do that now because I actually don't... Uh, uh, nothing against Clinton supporters, but, um, uh, but we don't yet have... We're on our way toward uh, developing such a, a global scenario to, to look at the implications of, uh, of lower population globally. Um, but so far what we have accomplished is some individual country case studies that we're... <coughs> in the process of linking, but I, I want to show you uh, some preliminary sort of intermediate results. Um, the model that we're using is called a population environment technology model. I won't go into any details for um, economists in the audience. It's a multi-region general equilibrium uh, model uh, of the global economy. It's, you know, basically what goes on in the models, there's a, a household side that is making decisions on how much to save and how much and what to consume. There's a production side that's producing those goods to consume. That production side uses energy in order to produce those goods, and that energy production produces CO2 emissions. So the model solves by making... There's the assumptions in here are that producers maximize profits, households maximize utility or sort of uh, consumption, um, and... Uh, one solves the model and see what kind of CO2 emissions result. Our, uh, this is a fairly typical standard kind of tool in the, in the emissions scenario world. Our contribution to this has been to take this household sector and break it up into different types of households. So you can differentiate the old from the young, large households from small, urban from rural, and, and see whether these changes uh, make a difference. I want to first show you some results for, from uh, a, a study of the U.S., uh, emission scenarios for the U.S., where we focused on aging, the potential impacts of aging, and also of changes in, in household size. Now, just why might this matter if, if, if the U.S. gets older? Why might this affect emissions? Well, it's because, you know, as we know, households that are older versus those that are younger behave different economically. This is true both on the income side and on the consumption side. So here's some data for the U.S., that shows, let's just look at small households. 
Uh, in here, that means households with three people or less in them. And older households have lower income. More of the income is from capital uh, than from labor. Younger households, of course, have higher income, um, and so that there's a large difference. There's a, a substantial difference in per capita, this is per capita income between small households and large households. The main reason is that most of the large households are large because there's children in them who are not earning money, but they're part of consumption. They're, they do, yeah, what's called dilute the, the income stream. And um, I have two daughters, and I have some data on that. Uh, and I'm sure you do as well. So um, it's a plausible explanation for what's going on here. And, and the idea in, in general is that if, if the U.S. is going to start, is going to, and is expected to, shift more toward older households um, that are, look like the 65-plus category, uh, how is that going to affect growth and income? Now, it's true that households also differ on the consumption side. Uh, I won't go through that, but households of different age and size have different patterns of consumption of different goods that may have different demands for energy to produce those goods and shifting towards consuming more of what older households consume and less of what younger households consume may also matter, and, and we try to account for that in, in the model as well. So what do we get? Um, here's a set of results for the effect of aging on CO2 emissions in 2100. It means in the long term, so the second half of the century, at least after 50 years. These are results, this is the percent difference in emissions that you get for scenarios that are equal in, in all ways, uh, except for whether or not we've accounted for aging. So we run a set of scenarios in which everyone in the U.S. is treated as identical, every household's identical, and then we run a second set in which we differentiate by age and include projections, demographic projections, with uh, plausible scenarios of aging. And we'd done this for three demographic scenarios, a one in which uh, households turn out to be smaller and older, a medium one, and one where they're larger and younger. And this is the effect. The aging effect is uh, more than a third, your emissions are reduced by more than a third when you simply account for the fact that the U.S. will be getting older. Of course, the biggest effect is in this small low population growth scenario because low population growth is also associated with more rapid aging. Um, so it's worth, you know, number one, noting that it's important to account for aging. That's one message. The other is that if you're interested in what would be the difference between a medium population path and a low population path, not just due to aging, but due to the difference in population size, um, by including aging, that is going to magnify the effect, the reduction in emissions that you would get from a lower population size. Because you're going to get lower emissions, uh, number one, because your population size is lower, and you're also going to get them even a little bit extra lower because that population is going to be older as well. Last, I want to show you just uh, results for China study we did of China where we took into account aging and household size changes, but also urbanization. Um, urbanization, I think it's obvious to think about that there's differences between households that are urban or rural that are at least or as large or larger than differences uh, across age. Households, urban households have higher per capita income. They, what this graph shows is energy consumption. All of these colors of energy consumption in cities and towns in China are commercial energy use. Uh, the blue one is biomass energy. So you see if the population is shifting from these kinds of households to these kind fairly rapidly over time. And this is not typically explicitly accounted for in the kind of scenarios that are in the climate change literature. And we wanted to see if this makes, makes a big difference. And here's the result. This is just presented in a slightly different way than the US. But this is an emissions projected emissions path for China from the year 2000 to 2100. The assumptions behind it are patterned after one of the IPCC storylines, the B2 scenario. And this red line shows a scenario where we treat everybody in China as identical and run this into the future and the economy grows and population changes and these are the carbon emissions you get. So about doubles over the course of the century. 
when we include the fact of aging, we see a you know, significant, it's you know, detectable but not overwhelming effect, lowering emissions due to aging, same as in the U.S. When we then add on top of that urbanization, we go from this yellow line <coughs> up to this blue one. The implications there <coughs> are, and we haven't looked at differences between uh, two different population size scenarios yet, but we just wanted to look at how important is urbanization by itself. And it looks pretty big. It's, it's a big effect. In, in these scenarios, instead of doubling emissions by the end of the century, you triple them. And, and these effects are mostly felt by the middle of the century, by 2050, uh, because much of the urbanization happens by, by the middle of the century. So my conclusions based on uh, the work since uh, 2000 um, is that there's, there's three, basically. One is that looking at historical analyses of past experience uh, supports a roughly proportional effect of population size on emissions. Future scenarios have not really yet explicitly looked at the implications of slower population growth. Um, work that we've done so far indicates that you're going to need to take into account aging and urbanization, probably not everywhere in the world, but in the areas where it's, where it's likely to matter, matter the most. I mentioned we are working towards some uh, global scenario analysis this year to look at the effects of lower population growth where we can take into account coincident effects of, of aging and urbanization and other things where, where it's relevant. And the kind of thing that we want to do is look at, you know, how much emissions reduction could you get from uh, a lower population path that more aggressively pursued the kind of policies that Joe was talking about. Another way to look at it is say that you've got a fixed long-term policy goal for climate change, preventing a, a doubling of concentrations in the atmosphere or something like that. How much less costly would it be? How much less would you have to spend on changing the energy system, for example, to reach that goal if you had a lower population path uh, rather than, than a medium one? Um, so I hope that uh, maybe I'll be back here again in the future um, with, with at least some bottom line to, to these answers. Thanks. Well, terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both very much. I think, um, as we had as we'd hoped, we had very complementary presentations where we can see the links, but obviously presenting and talking about different aspects of the relationship. Um, we'd like to throw the floor open for discussion, as I mentioned earlier. We'd like you to use one of the microphones that my colleagues will bring to you. Let us know who you are. And um, I think what we perhaps will do is collect a few questions and then um, give Brian and Joe an opportunity to, to respond to them collectively. So I see quite a few hands we'll get to. So Karen, why don't we start over here, and then Sean will come to this gentleman next. Oh, yes. Um, someone once said, and I don't know who it was, uh, the only thing we can be sure about is death and taxes. Um, the field of molecular biology seems to be advancing at a clip that's unprecedented, uh, starting with Eon w Wilmot in, uh, in Roslyn Institute in Scotland that turned uh, the theory of developmental biology on its head, in effect. Uh, in, in achieving mammalian cloning, uh, from the some of from some of this research, it is believed by a growing number of molecular biologists that we will imminently be able to address the problem of aging, human aging, and will be able to control aging rates early in this century. What will be the consequences of achieving that end? when most of the emissions are emanating from developed countries and one logically presumes if this science advances, the people that will have it most immediately to be able to manipulate their aging rates will be those that have the money and the power. So I'm curious because I listen to demographers all the time. They only discuss people getting on the elevator 
they don't discuss the exit, you know, the rate of exits. Sure, terrific. And, sir, if you could remind us who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Pete O.E. from NOAA. Terrific. Thank you very much. Gentleman right down here in front. Hi. My name is Larry Hausman from the Nature Conservancy. Um, I was just reading a, an article in the current um, Economist uh, talking really about the this staggering set of infrastructure programs that are going forward in China, uh, things like a growth in air traffic of 7 million in 1985 to 185 million uh, this past year, uh, 55,000 kilometers of expressways. I'm just wondering, um, in light of things like that, uh, it seems to me counterintuitive that you know, you have a proportional increase in population with an increase in, in emissions. Um, I appreciate that there are improvements in efficiencies, but it just doesn't s come together, the fact that you have such tremendous growth in, uh, now in, parts of the, in many parts of the world. Uh, their impact seems to me would be logical to think that that would uh, increase the uh, uh, number of emissions, the amount of emissions that you have. Okay, terrific. General, yes, please. Hugh McElrath, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. What we're seeing is a, a population bust in much of the developing world, but there's a lot of concern about how do you deal with the aging population, how do you have prosperity or a good economy in a condition of static or declining population. Now, I think that presupposes a different metric for what's a good economy. You know, we normally think GNP per capita, try to keep it going up and up and up. Does anyone, ha, has there been any research on coming up with a different metric? Okay, so declining population in developed countries. Why don't we take uh, one more and then we'll give our panel opportunity to respond. Thank you for your presentations. I'm Jason Bremner from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, not mentioned here is uh, current carbon emissions policies. I believe, I'm not an expert on climate change by any means, but I believe the at least the Millennium Development Goal uh, related to, car to carbon is a per capita emissions standard, a reduction in per capita emissions. What does that per capita emissions really mean in the, in the face of growing population? Have we sort of grabbed the wrong target there? Um, that's sort of my question, I guess, to Brian. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, Joe and Brian, one of you like to, you can divide and conquer, so t take your pick. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll start on aging because the other questions I think are mostly Brian's. Um, the population projections that the UN has, these three different levels, uh, have different death rate assumptions, and they assume uh, especially with regard to HIV AIDS, they assume that 70% of those with AIDS are going to have get antiretroviral or other similar treatments, that their lifespan is going to be longer. Um, and I think if there's a lot of change in death rates, this would certainly skew projections in ways that I can't describe now, but would certainly suggest larger populations. Um, I would, I'll just make one quick comment about slowing uh, growth rates are shrinking populations as we have in much of Europe, Russia, Japan. Uh, these are of great concern to, to the political leaders in those countries. Um, and uh, certainly any demographic change ha recreates stresses, whether it's really rapid population growth or declining population growth. I think that probably uh, countries eventually are going to have more elderly, this will happen in the developed world as well and is happening in the, in the developed world. And uh, how, these, how we cope with these issues is a bit up in the air, but I think I would rather have the problems faced by Sweden or Japan than the problems faced by India or Malawi. Yeah, I'll just make a one short comment on, on the aging question first is, um, first to note, I mean, if, if, the, if one would assume that greatly extending the, the lifespan would happen first in, in the developed countries, um, I mean, we should keep in mind that in, you know, within a few decades, 
emissions will be dominated by develop currently developing countries. The U.S. and Europe will be a shrinking fraction of, of greenhouse gas emissions, is a shrinking fraction, and will, will continue to be over time. Uh, so that still leaves that, you know, part of, part of the world as, as a major driving force in emissions. Um, but I think, you know, I'm, you know, I, I follow to some extent some of the debates uh, currently on how, how should one project particularly upper limit for, for lifespan. And, I, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's an open question. There are two schools of thought, and the current uh, high end of lifespan projections may well be too conservative. And the implications would be you'd get a lot more aging. Um, and then for emissions, it depends on what are people doing. Are they working longer? Are they in retirement longer? Um, what's their health status during that period of time? How does it affect economic growth? Uh, but I think it's an important question and, and you know, perhaps one of those wild cards that's out there than in a few years or five years from now or ten years from now, we're going to think, remember when we didn't, we used to think that lifespan wouldn't go above 85, you know? Uh, that could happen. Um, the, the question on, on, on China, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, you look at the, the, the rate of growth in energy consumption in, in China is, is, is quite high. Um, and that can seem at odds with the idea of, of, of population as a proportional impact. But, you know, I would say a couple things. One is that I showed results that were uh, kind of average results for an analysis that included all countries. If you separate countries by subgroups, you get different than proportional uh, effects. Um, and it depends on the, the level of income in the country and, and other things, the rate of income growth and so on. Uh, but on average, it, it's about proportional. The more important thing to keep in mind is that that uh, statistical analysis controls for other effects like income growth, um, urban development, uh, and, and so on, that says, you know, all else equal, what would, it, what, what would an increase in population do to emissions? Um, that's kind of like saying, well, in China, if you weren't changing the infrastructure rapidly and you had growth in population, what would be the effect? Uh, that's why I said, you know, those studies are suggestive, but they, they're not the end of the story. And I think it's one of the advantages of using models to do future scenarios, because then you can say, well, along with changes in population, we've got these other things going on, particularly urbanization, and those studies can integrate those effects. Um, and it's one of the reasons that in our China analysis, when you put in urbanization, you get much, much more rapid uh, emissions growth. Um, the the implications of say you know very low population or population bust in 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 the developed countries I think you're talking about um, I'm I'm not sure about the question for metric I think it's an important one and I think that's part of the nature of of the discussion is what does that mean you know if if population is going to be shrinking um, and even if that does mean lower GDP uh, per capita does that mean people are worse off. Uh, and I think that's that's an important question that's part of the debate at the moment. Um, I'm I'm interested in what's the effect on emissions because, you know, one thing I didn't mention is in the stress scenarios, the IPCC scenarios, they don't cover the low end of the range of global population. That's mainly because of the developing country story. Uh, the, the projections are just a bit out of date. But something that's hidden in there is that by design, they simply don't include a scenario in which uh, a low population growth path for developed countries is included. There isn't one in those scenarios. In every scenario, you follow at least the medium path for developed countries. And that may not happen. I mean, we may have you know, fertility below one and a half for a long time in many developed countries. What are the implications of that for emissions? You know, we don't know uh, at, at the moment. So I think it's, it's an important question is for the environmental impact. And last on current carbon emissions policies, and are we sort of missing the mark by focusing on per capita emissions? And I think no, it's just that uh, both are required. Uh, Population-related policies are not going to produce any, you know, immediately discernible effect on emissions. This is something that 
um, the, the, the reduction in emissions accumulates uh, over time and is effective really for, for the longer term. And that simply can't replace emission, reductions in per capita emissions that can happen in, in the shorter term and would need to happen in, in order to avoid some of the, the more extreme climate change outcomes. I think the, the issue is that the population option is just simply not on the table at the moment. Um, and, you know, my feeling is that, you know, there's no reason it, it shouldn't be. I, I mean, I understand that it's, it's a sensitive issue uh, and for good reason, and there are historical reasons for it to be sensitive. Um, but I think that with the climate change problem as serious as it is, and it's got a short-term and a long-term component, that population as one part of sustainable development paths should be part of the policy discussion related to climate change, and currently it isn't. Okay. Um, Suzanne? Suzanne Petroni? Thanks. Hi, Suzanne Petroni from the Summit Foundation. And, and your last point, Brian, is a good um, entree to a point I want to raise about the, the political nature of these issues. Um, first, I appreciate very much that both of you raise the issue of the United States, uh, both our, our population growth right now and our proportional or disproportional impact on global pop, uh, emissions. Um, and I think, you know, Joe, in his one of his last slides, raised the question of the moral dilemmas around these issues. And I think it's absolutely critical that we really put these moral questions at the heart of what we do in these discussions and before we move forward as, as groups around these issues, really think about them. And, um, you know, one of the factors involved in, in those north-south dynamics is that there seems to be this extraordinary sense of complacency um, among those who are concerned about global population growth and have been for the past decades around U.S. population growth. Um, the U.S. has grown by 50 percent in the past 50 years and will grow by about 140 million more people, according to the latest uh, Pew studies, in the next 40 years. That's the same amount that Nigeria is going to add in the next 40 years. It's more than Pakistan is going to add, and it's almost twice as much as in Indonesia is going to add. And yet we always talk about them and we don't talk about the United States population growth. If you look at your, your numbers and you talk, um, Brian, about the proportional impacts, and even though the U.S. will be a shrinking percentage globally in terms of our emissions, it is still going to be a behemoth in terms of our emissions. And we're, we're right now producing, what, 5 to 20 times the emissions as most developing countries that will hopefully change, both as we reduce our own and, and as developing countries um, develop and, and increase their own emissions. But um, proportionally, there is no question that the impacts of our own emissions will be significant. So my question is not, or, or my, my recommendation is not, let's take on U.S. domestic global population growth, um, but really to raise the question of the complexity and the ethical nature of us saying it's their problem, we need to focus on developing countries without first looking at ourselves. And yes, that raises some highly complex political issues, including immigration, which I'm not sure we're really ready to take on. So I, I just want to urge us to, to think about the complexities and the ethical nature of the issues that we're taking on here. Thank you, Suzanne. We'll go down to Rachel. Thanks, Jeff. Rachel Nugent from the Center for Global Development. And if Jeff indulges me, I have a question for each of the panelists. If not, you'll have to pick. No. Um, <clears throat> for Brian, I'd like to bore a little bit deeper into the assumptions in the model, um, just on the two main uh, drivers that you talked about, urbanization and aging, and ask if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about assumptions behind both. As I understand your results, if, if I didn't, please correct me, um, higher urbanization will be expected to, everything else being equal, increase emissions. And um, uh, older age structure, or more aging, will be expected to reduce it. And the assumptions behind each of those, I would imagine, are based on different consumption levels uh, in large part. But I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about that, because that gets at, of course, some of the possible policy levers. And for Joe, real quickly, I was going to ask about the, um, you mentioned one of the factors why perhaps population policy has, you know, fallen into the back seat a little bit over the years, uh, being the uh, beliefs about the effects of HIV AIDS on uh, population levels. And I wanted to ask about what 
the assumptions are about the effects of HIV AIDS on population sort of grosso modo, you know, large scale. But in your last response, you really um, caused me to be a little bit surprised. You said that the assumptions involve 80% of those infected by HIV AIDS being on, being on ARVs? 70. 70 percent. Okay, sorry, I misheard. Um, and you know, how far is that from reality? Thanks. Okay, gentleman right here. John Seeger from Population Connection. I want to put forward a, a, a scenario and ask uh, either of the speakers to comment on it. Right now, the average American emits about five and a half tons of carbon a year. Uh, let's assume, if we could for a moment, a contraction and convergence scenario for the world uh, where we reduce our carbon emissions by 2050 by 80 percent, down to 20 percent of what they are today. But the entire world also converges at that level so that basically you have equity, if you will, in terms of carbon. Every person on the planet emits about one ton of carbon a year. Right now, I think you could make a pretty good argument that about half the countries on Earth suffer from carbon emission insufficiency, that based on the available technologies that they now have, they're not emitting enough carbon to have what we would consider to be a decent standard of living. If we fail to address this question of equity and focus simply on reducing carbon emissions in the developed world, essentially we're consigning half the world to permanent poverty. If we don't make that assumption and we move in the direction of some kind of equity in terms of carbon emissions, then I think population growth becomes a paramount factor. And so I'd appreciate any comments on that. Great. Why don't we tackle those three if we could? Okay. Well, Suzanne, uh, thanks for the question about the U.S. and population growth. Um, certainly I haven't been on the list of those who uh, ignores that as an issue. It's interesting that we are very anxious that countries adopt population policies, but we are oblivious to that uh, issue in the U.S. Uh, certainly dealing with immigration is a tough issue, and it's uh, somewhat hard to come up with a totally win-win scenario, but clearly if we actually devoted more effort to foreign assistance so people had a lifestyle uh, in the developing countries which was attractive, and saw an economic future for themselves there. Uh, pressure to emigrate to the U.S. I think would be less. Uh, the other win-win situation, of course, is dealing with those 3.1 million unintended pregnancies in the U.S. and the 4.1 million um, unintended births, which is about half of the 2.9 million growth uh, of the United States every year. So that's certainly a place where we could do a lot better. Uh, I think uh, with regard to the moral dilemmas, I would just comment that uh, voluntary programs really are shown to work. Uh, there's no need for coercive programs, and I think ultimately they're counterproductive. And that the sacrifice to provide, I mentioned the need for $5 billion a year of population assistance for family planning. Uh, if you look at what is that cost per capita, we're doing a lot of per capita things here. Uh, for every one of us living in the developed world, that adds up to about $4 a year, $0.08 cents a week. Uh, if we doubled that to give a $5 billion development assistance for reproductive health, that would still be uh, like $0.02 cents a day, uh, something we could afford. It's not that the resources aren't there. Uh, I mentioned earlier we're spending $300 million a year on Medicaid. We're spending billion, that is. We're spending $9 billion a month in Iraq. Uh, it's a matter of political priority and political will. Um, with regard to HIV AIDS, um, I'm not a great expert on that, but the AIDS epidemic is focused in some countries where it has very profound demographic impacts. It's sort of basically stopped population growth in the most affected countries. But uh, again, if you look at Africa as a whole, they're still projected to add a billion people by uh, 2050. So uh, AIDS is a horrendous problem, but it's not, uh, it certainly doesn't affect the entire world. Um, maybe the whole John Seeger's question about carbon equity. Um, 
It's a tricky question. I, I think the, I don't know how accurate this is, but I've read somewhere that if every nation had the same global footprint in terms of the environment that the US does, we would need five planets to support the world. So clearly uh, there's a inequitable distribution of use of, of resources. And I hope that uh, it's possible for developing countries to pursue a path of economic development that doesn't mimic the West. I think that's a disaster. We need to somehow leapfrog the technologies we're using. We all need to evolve to, to more efficient technologies, more environmentally kind technologies. Put the rest over. Brian. Yeah, I would just um, add in, in response to Suzanne's question, uh, or comment really on, on the complexities is I, I think that's essential to, to keeping in mind. And I also want to emphasize that uh, while it is true that on balance the work on population and emissions indicates that you would get lower emissions with lower population and lower emissions that were, you know, a, a, a reduction that was significant enough to, to matter, it would not solve the climate change problem. It wouldn't come close to solving the ch climate change problem. Um, I was going to use the this wedges analogy at, at, at the end, but didn't want to go over my time even more than I al already had. Uh, but this, I think it's a good way to, to, to think about it, which is, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, there's been a, a kind of framework for thinking about emissions reductions uh, proposed by the carbon mitigation group at Princeton uh, called stabilization wedges. And a wedge of emissions reductions is uh, a, a pathway of emissions reductions over time that starts out small at zero today and grows to one billion tons of carbon by 2050. So that makes up a wedge. And if you take some standard scenarios for the future and say, well, we want to prevent the doubling of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and if we don't do anything, emiss global emissions are going to do this. And in order to prevent a doubling, we have to make them do that. Well, you need about seven or eight wedges of reductions in order to, to do that over the next 50 years. And then they go on to elaborate a whole bunch of things that you could do that would produce a wedge of reduction. So, you know, stopping deforestation, improving vehicle efficiency, changing this many coal plants to natural gas, and so on and so forth. And they say, okay, well, here's, here's 15 or 18 or 20 wedges. Pick seven or eight, and if you do them, we're, we're on, on the path. Um, one, way, one thing that we'd like to do with the population results is say, how, how many wedges could population policy provide by 2050? Uh, my guess, and I don't know the answer, but my guess is one, maybe two but I would be surprised if it were two. Uh, and I think that can put it in perspective. So if somehow the policy focus got shifted to population away from everything else, uh, we lose, right, in the climate problem. Um, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be on the table. We need all the wedges we can get, and some wedges are harder than others to do. And if this is a wedge that also has lots of individual level benefits as a kind of win-win policy for, for other reasons, uh, then it maybe should be, you know, one of, one of the ones that's, that's done first. Um, but it's not going to solve the problem on its own. Now that leaves out, you know, so what, what happens after 2050, and that's also an important part of the story because climate change is a long-term problem. But I think it's important to keep that um, in, in perspective. So it's not only the substantial complexities of the issue, and I think the U.S. is a, is a great example, but it's also just keeping perspective on uh, how much of a contribution can it, can it be in the end. Uh, I guess there were two other things. Um, one on the urbanization and aging question. So it turns out in both cases, what drives the results is labor supply, the effect of changes in labor supply. We're not making any assumptions about changes in retirement ages. 
The uh, labor leisure decision is not endogenous, it's fixed from the outside, so we haven't tested that. And so an older population, there's fewer, uh, a, a smaller working age population relative to the total population. Uh, that means GDP is lower overall, and so overall consumption comes down. Um, same thing but in reverse for urbanization, is that basically in the model what happens when people move from rural areas to urban areas, they become more productive. Re their contribution to GDP goes up, uh, and economic growth for the whole country is greater, and then consumption for the whole country, not just those households that moved, uh, goes up as well, and that's the main effect. So there's some effect uh, because uh, consumption mixes change, uh, but it's, it's mostly a scale effect for the whole economy. Um, and the last question on, on whether thinking about this, a future in which equity is achieved at some low level of, of per capita emissions, what are the implications for population? Um, well, that's a tough one. I mean, number one, the way you sketched it out is a good reminder of how daunting the whole climate problem actually is. Thinking about that happening by 2050, I think it's plausible that it can happen, but it's not going to be easy. Um, and for, I don't know, it sort of cuts both ways. If, if everyone's emitting the same, then I guess maybe your implication is that, well, uh, uh, then population is going to be the thing that's going to be shifting emissions up or down. If basically everyone's uh, at one, one ton per capita, sort of like the graphs you showed from Fred Meyerson about per capita emissions. Um, and, and I guess that's true. On the other hand, you can think of it as once you get to zero emissions per capita, you can have as many people as you want, right, from the emissions point of view. It's now population has been decoupled from, from the emissions side of, of the climate change problem, not from other, other parts of it. Uh, so, the, you know, so that the lower per capita emissions are, the smaller the effect of a, of a given change in, in population size. Um, so my answer is I'm, it's not actually clear to me what the implications are for the population component of the problem in, in, a, in a kind of low emissions, equitable future. Okay. Uh, Bob and Brian, how do we get the two of you? Thanks. Uh, Bob Engelman with the World Watch Institute. And I'm glad, Brian, that you did draw some attention at the end of your comments about uh, wedges to the, the difference after 2050 with population. And I think if you look at each of these wedges, what you find is that they stop being wedges after 2050. Mm -hmm. they, start to, they start to even out and they just go uh, horizontally to the right direction, whereas population has the exact opposite impact. That When you consider that the lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is around 500 years, um, this is a, not a problem of decades, but it's a problem of centuries. And on that scale, if you're willing to think long enough in the future, and unfortunately even the UN process isn't probably thinking as long as it should, population just gets more and more valuable as you look into the, not just the out decades, but the out centuries, and it's important to consider that as well. But my question is, is, is really different. I'm, I'm struck in listening to your description of what you're doing by how incredibly disproportional this IPCC problem uh, um, work is in terms of the huge amount of respect that the IPCC is getting, and deservedly so, uh, from the Nobel Peace Prize on down for a set of projections that we all really need to pay attention to and to use to get consensus around what to do around this problem, but that is built on work that Brian O'Neill and his small group can easily undermine by documenting what the projections actually show. It strikes me that and I think you might be a good candidate for making this pitch because I know you advise the IPCC that there's a real responsibility of the demographic community to convey, and the economic community I think too, to convey to the IPCC that, that future scenarios, and they weren't done the last time around, they haven't been done in a while, I don't know whether you know, maybe you can tell me when they're likely to be redone, but when they, whenever they are redone, they need to be done from a real transparent background of what the population projections show what the economic projections are, they're totally qualitative and hand-waving about these economic projections. You know, rapid growth will do this, slow growth will do that. Why doesn't the IPCC simply reveal what its assumptions are about, about uh, GNP and G, GP, global, uh, uh, gross global product, are going to be and how it all breaks down? I think what you've done with age is really interesting and it's totally, you could it so easily adapt this to projections 
of per capita emissions by assumably with each of the countries you looked at, and you just showed, I think, China and the United States, but you say you've done several case studies, you could actually do sort of a life cycle graph for the age, you know, zero to 80 to 90 years, you can see how much per capita everybody is emitting. That would be wonderfully useful given that the UN and EASA have tremendous age projections. It's much easier to project age structure than it really is uh, total population size because so many people have already been born. You could use these along with World Bank or other economic projections to come up with very detailed, eminently transparent projections of each country's future emissions based on things you could play with. Anybody with a computer could play with population, age, economic growth. And yet IPCC consistently doesn't do this. So I guess part of my question is, is anybody else other than you taking this work seriously? We need a, a few hundred Brian O'Neills out there. And I wonder who's funding this and whether there is more attention being paid. And is it actually starting to have an impact on IPCC? And do you have a, a personal plan for making sure that it does? Okay, if you could hand that, Bob, just to Brian. Um, wanted to thank both of you for your presentations. Lots to think about. Um, my name is Brian Greenberg, and I'm with Winrock International. And I, I think um, my question or this point mostly applies to Brian's um, presentation, but uh, but e I appreciate comments from either one of you. And I really excuse me if I if I draw points that others have made here together, perhaps particularly Suzanne's comment. If we take as um, the greatest, the, uh, the highest priority, preventing doublings of carbon dioxide or any other or, or greenhouse gas emissions generally, um, then the question really becomes how do we understand the contributions of the various drivers of total greenhouse gas emissions? And it's, it's intuitively pretty solid and I really appreciate your um, bringing up to date the information on the proportionality issue. But however exactly the proportionality goes, the question would really be what is the relative size of each of the wedges that would be needed and how cost effectively could each of those be addressed to achieve that increment of gain, not simply how big they are. And it isn't obvious to me that if I were prioritizing those, ranking those, and allocating resources accordingly that I'd want to put most of my resources or even underscore family planning and population as particularly an issue, at least not particularly a high priority issue. And um, I wanted to, to mention, it, refer particularly to your A1 scenario, which if I understand it correctly, assumes relatively stable population, the happy scenario of of family planning and population programs having been effective, relatively stable population. It seems to convey pretty clearly that economic growth can easily outstrip gains that might be achieved from stabilizing pop population increments. And in fact, that's taken as the desirable scenario by most policy planners. And so makes me wonder why the first conclusion, not the first conclusion, but one of the conclusions you draw is that we really need to focus on population stabilization and family planning. Without meaning to downplay that at all, its importance and its secondary benefits and so forth, it seems to me that the position we need to take is that greenhouse gas emissions need to be not just stabilized, but moved downward ultimately in a scenario in any, in any survival scenario anyway, and that critical to that would be figuring out how to bring economic growth to some sort of a steady state economy so that total demands um, created by population at whatever level plus consumption from that population is, is stable and, and manageable. Uh, and so just looking, looking for some reflection from either of you on that. Okay, those were two rich interventions. So why don't we take the two of those? Um, I'll start with the last one. Um, I think you ask about what's it cost to do the wedges. Certainly we know what it costs to do the population wedge. 
at least my estimate is about $15 billion a year for developing countries and, you know, an, an additional, say, $2 billion a year in the United States um, to provide support to everybody who needs family planning in this country. Um, if we add in reproductive health, that's a fuzzier number, but that would be perhaps another $15 billion a year. Uh, I would, you're suggesting that population may not be that important, and maybe you're not suggesting that, but I would just once again call attention to the numbers. Uh, the UN medium projection is another two and a half billion people uh, by 2050, and that's the size of the population in 1950. So that's a very substantial increase. And uh, if current fertility does not decline, then we're looking at five billion by that time, all in the developing countries. And I think the implications of this go far beyond uh, global warming. They ha have to do with uh, lifestyle, economic development. And I think there's some question whether in some of these really rapidly growing countries, they're going to get there without death rates going up. Uh, to constrain population growth for, for various reasons. Um, yeah, these are both great questions. Uh, let me start with Bob on um, on the the relation to, to IPCC. Um, I think, f for one, uh, hopefully this isn't viewed as, as undermining uh, the, the IPCC. I, I do think it points to some gaps. As I mentioned, these are acknowledged gaps. I mean, these people in the emission scenario community know about this. If you look in the fourth assessment report, uh, the chapters on emissions, this is the IP, recent IPCC assessment report, this is mentioned, uh, the, the fact that the demographic projections have kind of shifted out from under those scenarios. The, the population assumptions in, in, the, in the IPCC scenarios. They, they were consistent at the time. So remember, that, so that was published in 2000. These were probably put together in 1998. Um, and they were, but, but the views, outlooks have changed, um, largely because of new baseline data, just what, what, it was, what is fertility today uh, already. Uh, and it's lower than, than was it expected. Yeah, that that may be the case, um, and so I, I think that the I think that the IPCC and the emission scenario community, in particular, is much more open to looking at these questions than they were before. Partly just because this gap is acknowledged, there's a a part of the range of possible futures that hasn't really been explored. Now, that's different, though, from saying that there's real interest in looking at, explicitly looking at the potential effects of population policy. That I don't think there is. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see over time. Um, I, I think that the, there, there's also interest on the adaptation side and something, you know, of course, that I skipped entirely, but what sort of demographic factors may influence the resilience to future impacts, there's also a lot of interest in that. There's a lot of interest in spatial development patterns um, and implications for land use. And, and so I, I think it's fairly receptive at this time. Um, funding, you know, I, I should mention that Hewlett is funding the, the project that we're working on now for developing these global scenarios. Um, and there has been uh, a lot of a lot of interest in this. Uh, the Compton Foundation kind of got us started uh, on this. There is also work, I think, from government agencies in the integrated assessment field. Or there's interest uh, in this this kind of work. Um, NIH funds some population and environment work, and uh, haven't gotten funded from them yet, but we'll be trying soon. Anybody from NIH here? Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably sort of cautiously optimistic about the outlook for, for this kind of work. Um, on the, the second question on, on basically the relative effectiveness or desirability of different wedges, I agree that 
you know, exactly as you say, the way to look at this is to evaluate the, you know, relative benefits and costs of different policy options. We should be looking at that. Um, we're not doing work on the costs of population policy, but Joe talked some about it. Uh, and there's some work also funded by Hewlett at the Center for Global Development going on on exactly that question is getting some new new estimates of uh, of these costs. Um, and I, I think it should be, you know, evaluated uh, at least partly on that basis. Of course, the political and ethical and other issues that are raised are also important to, to, to thinking about it, but I, I think it should be. Um, and I think you're, I mean, you're, you're right, you know, clearly that economic growth can outstrip any of these gains. That's true. Uh, technological change in one direction or the other can easily outstrip the gains. That's, that's also true. But I don't think that that means then that population policies are, are not effective in, in their own right or shouldn't be on the table. It's just that, you know, economic growth may be, you know, several wedges uh, worth of effect on emissions. Are you going to want to have policy to, to reduce economic growth, though? I, I don't think so. I think it's more relevant to the technology question, and that's really what makes the big difference within the A1 scenarios, different assumptions about a technological progress in fossil fuels versus, uh, versus renewables. And I think that's, that's, that's important, and that re in the end, both of these things matter. Some things matter more than the others. My point is not and I want to repeat this again, that it is, it is not that we need to focus on the population issue. I do not think that the first word that comes to mind when we think about climate change policy should be population. I do not think that is the case. Right now, the word is not raised at all, and I also think that's not appropriate. I think it should be on the table and looked at uh, as other approaches are, this is the spirit of the work we're doing now, um, and I think the, you know, the, the most accurate description is, is, is right now it's not on the table at all. So we're far away from any situation where we've now suddenly focused on population as a solution to the climate problem. Can I ask a follow-up to that, and this may be something where there just hasn't been time to develop or remains to be seen, but I seem to remember in the coverage of the recent COP in Bali, that one of the um, statements from the Chinese government attributed in part one of their contributions to a uh, lowering emissions has been their population policy. And they had projections of what their emissions would have been had they not uh, made changes um, that uh, resulted from that policy. Is that something that is, uh, is it just China that's made that kind of statement? Is that anything that is going to potentially spur interest or attention or backlash, um, given where we're sitting, um, those kinds of linkages within that forum? Well, China pointed out that their population is 300 million smaller than it would have been without their population policies. Of course, that's the U.S. population. Uh, I don't recall exactly what they said about emissions, but clearly they were taking credit for that. Um, of course, you've raised the point of whether that will be sensitive because their policies um, had a coercive nature and their one-child family per family uh, policy, which, by the way, was not really necessary, uh, which we've proven in many other settings that uh, voluntary programs, when they're extremely well run, uh, will get you just as far, just as fast. So um, there may be other countries that have spoken that way, but it, it's a little mixed of a bit of a mixed blessing to have China speaking up, is all I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's something, it's a good point to raise because it's a good recent example of some of the, you know, risks and some of the quagmires you might mm -hmm. find yourself in. Um, but, you know, I, my assumption, and, you know, this is really n not, not my area, but my assumption is that it is possible to differentiate be be between different types of policies that one might support that are, are population related. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I would guess that uh, if population does become a larger part of the climate policy discussion, that these kinds of issues will continue to come up. 
um, but I think they're not uh, insurmountable obstacles. Um, and the the other thing that I, I would say is that is that I mean the context that I think of this in, you know, partly because I come from this scenario modeling world, is uh, one of the primary conclusions that comes out of the emission scenario modeling is that one of the biggest things that matters to deciding how hard or easy it is to achieve some climate policy goal, longer term goal, is which of those qualitative storylines are you in? Are you in an A1 world, B2, B1, or so on? Those are all scenarios in which the assumption is there's no climate change policy. That, that was done for a reason, to sort of provide a reference, a set of reference scenarios for here's what might happen if we do nothing about climate change. Emissions might turn out to be really high. They might turn out to grow substantially, but then tail off and be not so high. And those are all possible worlds. And if you then say, okay, well, if we want to prevent a doubling of concentrations in the atmosphere, how much is it going to cost? You have to say, well, where am I starting from? You know, the high A1 scenario or the, you know, low B1 world. Um, and that makes one of the biggest differences to the result. So I think then the, the, the policy conclusion from that is then why shouldn't broader development pathways be considered as population policy? Things that, can, that are going to increase our chances of being in a world that looks more like B1 than like the high end of A1 um, should be preferred or the difference between A2 and, and B1. Population is one of those differences. It's, it's not the only one, uh, but, it's, but it's one of them. It's one part of looking at a, a development path over time that the, the development path in general is a crucial determinant of, of how hard it's going to be to deal with the climate problem. Um, and I think that is a, uh, something that's well-founded and grounded in the scenario literature. It's, it seems to make sense to me, and it seems to put population in an appropriate context. It's one part of sustainable development path uh, that's going to matter for dealing with the climate change problem. Terrific. Well, we, we've come to the end of our time. Obviously, not the end of the discussion um, of this of this topic, uh, whether it's in the research and scientific side or the political and policy side. Um, what we promise to do here at the center is try to continue that conversation and be, and be a resource for all of you most specifically for today's discussion to capture um, some of the insights here on our website and, and have including the video and the audio and make that available to all of you. And I think just as importantly to folks who weren't here in the room um, as we take this discussion forward, we will be having as part of this series meetings on a monthly basis. Uh, we have one next month that will look at um, assessments of these integrated pop health and environment programs on the ground. John Pielemeyer's here. He's John's going to be speaking, and uh, Lori Hunter, another Colorado import, um, and David Carr from California. So 